So plywood sources um, is a question that came up in different types of plywood sources. I'll start uh, with that one. In fact, I don't use plywood. Um, I use actually basswood. And uh, pretty much everybody probably does a quarter inch. I do a quarter inch solid basswood and I just like the look and feel of that better. Um, I found a new supplier uh, in New York. Um, basswood has kind of been creeping up in price a little bit. And I told them, I said, you know, I'm going to this uh, puzzle convention and I'm buying basswood from you. I may have other people that may want to use basswood or he also sells finished birch or uh, finished plywood. So he sent me a bunch of catalogs and he gives me a discount and he said, pass that discount along to anybody that wants it. So I have these on my table and on the front it says 10% fool's gold. That's what I do. So if you are interested in basswood and you want a discount on it, you can pick up one of these. The code is right on the bottom, the bottom middle and you'll get 10% off his prices, which are pretty good. So um, I use basswood and I think I'm gonna pass the mic to see what other types of wood people use and any sources if you want to give that information. Well, I... All right. Okay. The, uh, the constraints on wood for laser cutting are different than the constraints for hand cutting. So you don't really want a multi-ply wood because the glue is the hardest thing to cut through. We have a custom plywood made by a guy named Jerome who runs a business called Aircraft Plywood in Chicago or near Chicago. And he uses a basswood core with whatever sort of veneers we want and sort of tries to give us as clean cores as possible because anything that you hit with a laser, if it has weird stuff and it voids knots, anything will go awry. Uh, I'm lucky, lucky enough to live 10 minute drive from Boulder Plywood in Somerville, Mass. It's B O U L T E R. And in fact, they gave us uh, a stack of 10 by 10 samples. Linda Chevelle, uh, raise your hand. Um, I think they're next to her station over there. And there's some business cards from them. I have no relation to the company, but I get my plot from them. Uh, I think these samples are Okume 5 ply, Okume uh, mahogany, which I used to use. So I've switched over to a 5 ply. Sapile, uh, also straight mahogany, but from the same manufacturer. Um, an eight, four by eight sheet of plywood goes straight, cut down in a couple sections so I can get it in my car, it's about $130. I also am using the Bolter plywood in addition to the Okume. I've also gotten some cherry poplar plywood from them that I really liked using as well. So um, I, would, I would recommend that you take a look what they may have. Unless you're a laser cutter. <laughs> so I actually got a sample set of four things for Bolter uh, Ply and I could not cut through it at all uh, with my laser. Uh, it, it's too thick, it's got way too many layers, it's, it's a beautiful plywood but not for lasers. So what I use is a, a new recent product from Home Depot of all places. Um, you can buy it online. It's called uh, Columbia Pure Bond, and it has literally been cut to the correct size for my specific laser. <laughs> so if you don't know me, you don't know the laser I use, I use a Glowforge, which has got a lot of advertising lately, so maybe you've seen it on Facebook or something. Um, and the bed of that is 12 by 20. Most laser beds are at least 12 by 24, so um, this plywood is actually 12 by 20. So I know it's cut specifically for
for the glow quartz laser. But it's about 10 sheets for $45. And um, you order it on their website. You can get it quarter inch, I uh, get quarter inch maple. Uh, it also comes in walnut, cedar, and birch. Sorry for going so high pitched. <laughs> Okay, I am. Um, uh, I live in Texas, and uh, I buy my plywood from Fort Worth um, Plywood Company. And uh, typically, I will buy um, uh, Okume um, five ply wood. Um, I used to use Baltic birch, but I find it very difficult to get reliable uh, sources of that, and I've given that up. But it, the um, Akume is a much softer wood, and it's much easier to cut. And uh, I've had really quite good um, results with it. Any other questions on plywood or plywood sources? Okay, we'll move on to the next question I got was the best scroll saws, uh, which is I guess the best one that will do the job, and I, I will start with that one, where I had to cut one time a four foot um, by four foot puzzle, and my 18 inch uh, delta would not handle that. So the only one out there that I could figure I could use is a 30 inch Excalibur, so I got one of those. And if you have a four foot by four foot, even the 30 inches is too small, but if you start right in the middle, that's two feet. So I put the blade, the 8,000th blade, in this <laughs> huge um, piece of wood and cut um, that. So the best saw for that project was a 30 inch Excalibur. So um, I'm not sure if I can answer what the best scroll saw is, but Conrad uh, is going to help us. Uh, I'll use this opportunity to uh, point out something I said at the workshop yesterday. You could have six very experienced scroll saw cutters up here, and we're not going to agree on the best saw, the best blade, the best wood, best way of handling dust, etc. Uh, so yeah, try things and we won't give you what works for us. Um, for most of my puzzles, I was using an 18 inch variable speed delta, and that was great. Then I want to cut larger things, and I spent more money on the Jet 22, which is out there, and I love it. It actually, but it took a bit of adjustment. There's something about the blade, the way it goes up and down, the way that it moves or doesn't move with the wood. I, it took me a week or so to adjust, but I really love it. Now. And I have right now an Excalibur that I use. I got it used from Stave, actually. They were selling <laughs> off some of their saws. So I highly, highly recommend if somebody's looking to buy a saw to start out just to try it that you can always take a look and see if there are used saws out there because a lot of times the saws that are used are still they still have a lot of life in them and then i recently just bought a 30 inch uh, pegas from up in canada at bear wood supply and i'm really loving that saw as well computer controlled that cuts with light yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I do have what I consider to be the best scroll saw available, and that's an Eclipse. And they're not made anymore, you can only buy them on the used market. Um, and uh, the reason I say it's so good, it really is an industrial saw. It was, it was built by a, a telecommunications engineer who, had, who was um, a hobbyist and for, for scroll sawing. And uh, he decided he could build a better one, one with a perfect vertical motion, no forward and backward movement of the blade. And that's what he did. It's rather like a bandsaw, only it reciprocates instead of just continually driving. driving. And it takes normal blades and it's absolutely a gorgeous saw. Unfortunately, the guy has died and his business is out of function. scroll saw I have is like a <clears throat> tiny miniature Dremel scroll saw, which you wouldn't even think that they make that, and I uh, don't recommend it. <laughs> it was gifted to us. 
Any other questions on scroll slogans? Scroll songs. Okay, let's go on to the next question. That's over to the laser, uh, Janelle, and they talked about uh, about designing software for the laser puzzle. What software is it? Specifically yeah. me? Because he does that weird. Well, yes, he does. Well, we're weird, so we write all of our own software, and our puzzle cuts are almost entirely generated by the software that we write, but we do use Adobe Illustrator to sort of both run the laser cutters and do any minor edits or tweaks that we need to do. Adobe Illustrator is too rich for my blood. <laughs> so I use the free software Inkscape on my desktop and uh, I start out on my tablet and that software is Concepts art app and they have an Android and a Mac version. Okay. And the next question we have here talks about how to mix materials. It says epoxy resin and wood. Would that work? I have no idea yet. It won't waste it. So does anyone... It's a mess of high laser. That's tall. Yeah. Well, right over there. <laughs> okay. Any comments on this? Says how to mix materials, epoxy resin and wood. Would that work? The answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Or a saw. Do you have to? Do you have to use special blades, or are you using your normal blades? Normal blades. Really? Normal but blades. Be careful because the transition from the wood, the epoxy is softer, and so I can't cut the usual pieces that I do with Makes sense. Okay, thanks very much. Um, next question is from Jesse on UV printing. So I'm not sure what your question is, but I'll ask you. No, it's not my question. <laughs> it's not it's a question for me. I don't know. It says, oh, maybe it is. Maybe that's how that is. It says UV printing. Sure. Well, I can talk about UV printing. <laughs> You're wrong. Well, we've recently started UV printing some of our puzzles, which is a method of printing that doesn't require paper. So rather than printing on paper and then mounting that in the, the wet glue or dry mount press, we have a flatbed printer that prints directly off the wood with UV sensitive inks. It's a pretty expensive machine, costs about $30,000. And that's for a relatively small machine that prints 16 by 24 inches. Providing the advantage is that, as anybody who knows, the paper is like the weakest link in the durability of a puzzle. And so if you have no paper, it's just directly on the wood, it's much more durable. It's a, you know, there's a bit of a trade-off because the inks aren't necessarily as, uh, as light uh, no, they're vibrant, but they're not as, as light permanent. Like they, they'll degrade if you're in sunlight more than like a, a pigment ink jet print or something like that. Now, most people don't keep their jigsaw puzzles in sunlight, so it's not the biggest concern to me. I'm more concerned about just like the durability of the image itself. So for that, it's a big win, in my opinion. And it also helps with our process because one of the things that you can do is rather than putting an image on wood and then cutting it, you can cut and then print after you've cut the puzzle. And I imagine that for most hand cutters, you don't want to do that because you're sort of using the image as you're cutting. Though I could imagine, you know, there's interesting ways to incorporate that in the process. You can print something on a piece of wood, use that as a guide to cut on it, and print on it again. So one of the things that I know other puzzle companies do is they'll actually reprint on a puzzle that they, that you already have. So you can like send a puzzle back and have a new image printed on top of it, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if anybody else has any experience with UV printing or using a service bureau. I'll just sort of extend this question to be like, how do we do printing of our things? Um, I've decided to not invest in a fancy, expensive printer. I decided didn't want to deal with the space and the expense and, and specific paper and inks. Um, 
I mean, I can walk to a Staples and print things out, and I figure they have a better printer than I do, and it's for like a couple dollars for a big print. And I don't live near anything in South Dakota, <laughs> so I have I have an inkjet printer that I use, and I use an archival paper that I found felt like the right weight for me to use in my cutting. So that's that's what I had delivered to my door. If you see my puzzles over on this corner, uh, you might know that I paint with watercolor on a primed plywood board. So I just avoid paper altogether. Uh, yeah, I just use a, a color laser printer for most of my puzzles. Um, and it's, it's nothing special, but it does do a, a very good job. And then I, I cover the um, laser printing with uh, acrylic um, uh, paint, or acrylic uh, surface, and that really seals the, uh, the um, colors onto, onto the, the, the paper. So we're gonna talk about sealing. Sealing the supply. You said feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I'll feel good. Go ahead, talk about the ceiling. <laughs> so I use, I'm pretty sure it's Krylon brand, uh, triple thick clear glaze on my puzzles because I really like the super shiny and the really soft touch that it gives to puzzles. And on the back, I actually sand and oil them with uh, Odie's wood butter, which is um, Totally non-toxic, so I just spread it on my hands and <laughs> spread it on the puzzle because I'm doing it after it's been cut. So I don't want to get uh, like beeswax and stuff in between the pieces. So I thin it out with my hands and warm it up and just put it right on. And if we're talking about sealing, <laughs> I, I use a dry press so that I have a laminate on the top of most of my puzzles. But if I'm not going to use the laminate, then I also use a UV acrylic spray instead of the laminate. On the backs, I have tried all kinds of things on the backs of the puzzles from absolutely nothing. I use um, bowling alley wax I found actually works pretty well. And that was recommended to me for some of my furniture by some furniture makers. And I thought, well, if it works on my furniture, it should work on the back of the puzzle. That's pretty good as well. Uh, I don't uh, spend time uh, sealing the front, except if the photo I'm printing at Staples is larger than 11 inches on both sides, in which case I learned the printer that they use, or large format printer, looks the same as, a, as a 11 by 14, but will soak up the rubber cement that I use uh, for figure piece patterns and apparently smudge and ruin them. So I do, in those cases, use a cryon, cryon spray on a few times to help prevent that from happening. Uh, I've chosen not to seal the back. I like the look of the, of the cipulae uh, mahogany, um, but I, I think some of the backs that the rest of you stain and, uh, and, or oil do look great. It also was a traumatic time in my early 20s when I was putting some stain in the back and it dripped through the front and ruined it, so that's another reason I didn't do it anymore. And we also make paper puzzles, and we used to do an acrylic spray on the front, but we invested in a roll coating machine, which just coats it really fast, and we actually sourced it from Alibaba, which was an experience because you can get like a machine for a thousand dollars that he bought trying to buy it locally would cost like over ten thousand dollars. I was finished with uh, Epson makes a number of papers and that's what I use. There's um, matte paper that doesn't give that glare. Uh, they have a glossy and in between they have a luster paper so I think we typically will use the luster paper. It's not super shiny and it's not matte but it really pops the color printer I use has 10 inks in it now. The older one had nine inks, so uh, the inks are expensive. Um, so, um, and in the back of the puzzle, I use tongue oil and a paste wax um, as well to finish it off. Um, any questions on any of that? All right, let's move on to, I think back in Rochester, Joe Seymour had given us a sheet 
that had all the little different um, signature pieces and we had to figure out whose company it was. So the question that was posed here is, is there a database of those signature pieces? Um, I don't know if anyone knows that answer. I know Joe had put together quite a bit of them. Um, does anyone here know if there is any database of that? I think other than what Joe had done for us and with that game in Rochester, I don't, I don't know if that's all. Might be something, something. I'm sure everybody has some type of signature piece, turtle. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and if you do decide to cut puzzles or do cut puzzles now, you probably either have a signature piece or it's a good identifier to, to get one. So down the road when you know someone might lose the box or not sure who cut it. Um, and I think you know your dad and uh, you know uh, collecting puzzles, you can tell who cut it by the, the hunched cat and all that type of thing. So it sounds like a, a list or database of signature pieces would be something that someone like, uh, do we have a historian of wooden chaser puzzles in the house? Yeah. And also, if, if someone says, oh, I was the first to use a cat, she'll say, oh no, blah, 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 from 1912, probably used a cat. So, sorry, sorry to give you more work, Ann. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, I think I was leaving off with if you are cutting or plan to cut, um, figure out a signature piece that's your own that will identify your puzzle. That would be great. Hey, put in the database. Oh, uh, hold this just like yes. this. Yes, yeah, that's excellent. Okay, next thing we have on this list is licensing arrangements and finding artwork. Um, for myself, um, I've contacted a number of different artists, and they allow me to use their illustrations or images and photographers as well. And what I do is I pay them back a, a small royalty for me to, to do that. Um, so that's what I've been doing. Uh, there's a little artwork I do myself, but um, I cut more than I draw, so to speak. So some of the newer things that I'm doing, I'm actually painting, so um, that's it. Uh, we're going to talk about artwork, licensing, how it works, and you don't have to answer the question if you is well, we do some puzzles where we make our own artwork. We have some puzzles where we're using publicly available artwork, like the images from NASA are all public domain, and we actually modify them and we make them tile. And then we have a few collaborations with other artists, like Chris and a couple other people that we know where we have a royalty agreement where we pay us a small percentage for every puzzle we sell. Uh, I don't do uh, copies of, of anyone's art. Um, uh, I recommend that uh, people go to our YouTube, the Puzzle Parlor YouTube channel for last year, the virtual. There's a great talk by Rebecca Tushnet, who's here, about copyright and puzzle images. I recommend you uh, watch that. And I do some of my own artwork, but when I have a custom puzzle that somebody wants to be done with a specific artist, I have reached out to the artists themselves. Sometimes the price comes back at more than I would even be charging for the puzzle. And we decide to go with a different piece of artwork. Sometimes um, some artists say, you're welcome to use it. And they give it to us for free, a one-time use for free. And so it just really depends. But I, I always try to get the, um, the permission from the artist in that case. I also have used greeting cards. I think you've seen when we were doing our cutting <coughs> class, we had things that were like greeting cards or images from magazines or it could be calendars. So I have a lot of just pages that I've saved out of books and such over time and, and when I'm deciding to do my own puzzles to sell, that's what I look at. 
for me. The puzzle is the art. It makes the art. So uh, I'm painting it most of the time. I'm trying to check in on my flight for tomorrow. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have fun. Well, I um, when I originally started cutting um, jigsaw puzzles, I thought that was going to be a major problem finding the artwork to work with. But uh, as I carried on, I found there were more and more public domain um, artwork, and that's what I use exclusively now. I never get involved with copyright artwork. Um, and so, if you go to Wiki Commons, for instance, there's a website, Wiki Commons. And it has more more public domain artwork than you ever be able to use. Okay. Good Any follow? yes? Question. So when you got a one-off app show of the artist, how formal did you go for email, or was that a, you know all sent by lawyer? No, no. It's been pretty much by email at this point. As long as I know that. You know, I've contacted the artist, or I see that my customer has because, and then I also have some language that says, "This, if you're buying a custom puzzle for me, you are saying that you have the rights to that image." But um, yeah, we've done an email and just kept those emails on file. Yeah, either a, a note or an email I've gotten. Um, what I tend to do is I try to promote that artist as well. So if you buy a puzzle from me and it was done by a certain artist or illustrator, in the box you'll get my information, but you'll also get information about the artist and how to contact them and see their work. So I try to, that's part of my spiel, I try to sell that to the illustrator or whatever that will help promote you and, and expand your, you know, someone they would never get to. Okay, any other questions on that? All right, next we have, I see about, um, how do you calculate pricing? And um, I think, um, I don't know, anyone in a, how to answer that? How do you calculate pricing? I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> Laser time. It's more than I have. And it is square inch area of the puzzle and whatever the cost of my box is and all of the things. And then that's you know, multiplied by some factor. We also sell puzzles wholesale, so we sell them to stores, which if you're unaware, most stores buy things at like roughly 50% of the cost that they sell things for. So that is something that you need to account for if you want to be selling things to stores. You know, make things a lot more expensive than you would otherwise. I uh, charge per piece and I'll round up a lot if I'm doing a lot of custom figure pieces like the name that might take a while. And then add in uh, the cost of shipping and whatnot. Um, I have been better, uh, have, have, a have a spreadsheet of you know, based on the square inches of, of the puzzle, if I cut this style, it's gonna be 2.0 pieces per square inch. If it's a different style, it's 2.3 on average, and that helps me at least estimate what the cost will be to the customer. I keep track of all of my costs and have an idea of a certain size puzzle will cost me this much in materials. I have an idea of how much time I spend talking to a person or emailing a person over the telephone or over the email, and um, I find that I tend to spend more time than I expected, so I make like five dollars an hour. But I enjoy what I do. <laughs> After I get done with the work on the puzzle, I think about what would I be annoyed to get paid? <laughs> and what's the break point for that? Like. Yeah, I mean, if I put like 10 hours into it, I don't want to do, you know, $30 puzzle. I want it to at least feel like I'm getting the value of it. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, it's difficult to answer this question because I tend to uh, ask 
the price that um, I think I can get. I don't always get it, but that's what I do. But uh, I do sell some, uh, when I sell a puzzle on eBay, which I do regularly, usually every week, I don't, I don't have one there at the moment. Um, I started off at a penny, it starts off at a penny. And uh, that way, people are encouraged to bid for it. And I have, has got, gone up, the most I've ever got for one of my postcard puzzles is $160. And, but that started off at a penny. But unfortunately, sometimes they wind up selling for um, $20, uh, which then I'm not very happy about. But at least I get the marketing aspect of it um, on a regular basis. So um, it all works out. And most of what I do is custom work for people. So uh, what I'll try to do is talk to the customer over the phone, try to get an idea. You can try to qualify your customer and then figure out what they want. And I ask if there's a budget at all, and the budget might be $500, it might be $150. And then I kind of size things accordingly to kind of work with the customer so they're happy with the product. Um, and I fig try to figure out, well, materials and the cost as, as these folks do here. Um, and I just, I probably don't charge enough and you probably don't charge enough uh, for the time we put into it, uh, they'll send a little photo of Timmy, and there's a little on uh, Rose's leg in the, you know, the shot that does nothing for it. So you take, uh, you know, the time to Photoshop that out, clean it up, and do all that. And I don't charge for any of that. And so by the time you get this puzzle, that's $150. Like you make maybe four dollars an hour, <laughs> but the customer is happy and they get a beautiful puzzle. So. Um, as far as the stores, um, in New Hampshire, they have the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen stores, and uh, which I'm juried into that. And they have, um, you know, price points they like to hit. You know, anything $50 or less, they would love that. Well, that's great. Uh, when uh, Jesse says they take, you know, half of that, uh, which they almost do, uh, so on a $100, well, on a $50 puzzle, you know, Half of that's 25, and they, you know, give you a little bit more than that, but not much. Um, but you're making literally nothing. <laughs> so uh, that's all I got to say on that. So, <laughs> and anyway, um, I was curious on Dry Mount Press um, if people use Dry Mount Press and what the temperature is that you use in the time setting you use for it. I do use dry mount press. I'm trying to remember what temperature we use now. We vary. We use um, the Fusion What's that? port, yeah. And the time is really tends to be more dependent on sort of the rhythm of mounting. We're mounting like many things at once, but it's around three minutes. But in my experience, it usually doesn't hurt if you leave it in there for an extra five minutes. It's really only like if you are really negligent and leave it in there for like 10 minutes that you see some sort of like scorching of the image or something. Uh, yes, I uh, use a dry mount press. But it's, it's kind of small and um, most things I like, do a little larger than that, so I use a 3M Super 77 spray, but when I do use dry mount, about 300 for about three minutes, but as you point out, the, the biggest risk is if you underdo it and, and doesn't adhere, if it, something to lose track and it goes for four or five minutes, there's no difference. I use a dry mount press from the 1980s that I bought for $100 off of eBay, and it's pretty large actually, it's nice, but the temperature gauge doesn't work, so I use my, uh, like my turkey temperature thing. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's right around 230, 240 degrees, and I do a six mount press. I mean, a six minute press. Yeah. Just just making sure it's clean. Yeah. No no dust at all, and not super warped. 
prefer not super warm. Just don't want to waste the wood, though. <laughs> cut it, cut it down. Yeah, scrap. Oh, yeah. Use it for smaller. Use it for much smaller things. Yeah. But. but yeah, just uh, making sure that it's really clean. I have those yellow cloths that I get at Costco that really pick up the the dust and stuff. I find that that's good to get the little bits of dust off of the wood before I start putting the layers together. Are there any other general questions that we haven't covered that people would like to know more about? Because you have people here that can probably answer them. Hey, hey, that's right, here yeah, we go. Talked a lot about the papers. I'm just curious about the inks. Doesn't apply if you're getting it printed as staples, but it does apply if you're getting it printed as Printers and printer inks, and wondering if that's something that you might wrestle with. Yeah, again, I use an Epson um, Sure Color 700 series printer. It's got 10 inks in it. Um, it does a really nice job. I use Epson. I'm kind of an Epson person more than an HP person, I'll say. Um, I know Staples does HP. Um, those are archival? Yes. Yeah, and the paper uh, is Epson paper. They've got uh, like they what two hundred like here they say or whatever the term is. Um, I'll never know that, but um, so that's that's what I use. I like that paper. It's served me well. The thing that um, you have to be aware or careful of is not to have too thick of a paper, like a rag paper. Um, the paper I use, I wouldn't want even more thicker. It's 10 mil, MIL. Copy paper might be about 4.9, um, I've seen, um, or, or less. Um, so the thinner paper actually has an advantage uh, than the thicker paper, but um, the one I use is 10 mil. That seems to be okay. Do we also print with Epson on sort of a the bigger version of the printer you use, which is like a two-foot plotter printer, and it prints on roll paper, and it has, I think, 12 inks, and it's like an archival ink system. And yeah, we print on like the thinnest possible paper that we can use well, which we found is like this HP paper, a matte paper, and I think it is like 4.5 which, yeah, thin is good, <laughs> my experience. But I mean, there are even thinner papers, but the knife was too far. I also use an Epson, and I don't believe mine is the archival ink, though I have a ProGraph, and I do use the um, archival laminate over top and such, so I'm hoping that that is going to keep it as color fast as an archival ink would as well. And when it comes to my papers, I found, I don't remember what my mill is, but I did find that there are different weights. So it's not just the mill, but the weight of the paper. So I was looking for the thinnest, heaviest that I could find, because that made me think that it was the most compressed, because I didn't want the paper that was really loose, because those are the ones that seemed to fray a lot more. So I looked for heavy and thin at the same time. I use artist quality pigment in the watercolors. So when I buy, I like to get um, small batch handmade watercolors uh, that do weird things. <laughs> like uh, they'll have two different pigments in them. So uh, it will kind of drop out. And you could probably, if you look at my process, you'll see that where it will like have kind of a, a floating top color. And then it'll have in the texture that I create with the gesso, which is also artist quality, um, it will kind of drop into that so it really accentuates the texture, but when you touch it, it's got that high gloss on it, so you don't really feel texture so much as smooth. I, I very much agree with the thin paper solution. You really don't want to use thick paper unless you really know what you're doing. 
um, because I find that uh, when the, the, the thicker the paper, the more likely it is to de delaminate. So it looks, it looks as though your glue has, has failed, or adhesive has failed against the wood. But when you examine it clearly, you'll see that your, your adhesive has still worked. It's just the paper has actually delaminated. And if you catch it before you ship it out, then you can just put a little dip of glue there and uh, press it down. But um, once it's gone out the door, there's really nothing you can do about it. Any other questions on yes? I had a question for, I don't know, I have never tried it, but I was tempted uh, to try a two-sided puzzle. And I know there are blades that are especially made for that. I don't know um, if anyone you know, that does that regularly and has a preference for what blades work well to prevent a lot of uh, okay. Um, on two-sided puzzles, I have done two-sided puzzles for a while, and um, Pegasus is a blade that I use, um, and it's called a modified geometry. It's a reverse blade, so if you blew it up, teeth would be going down, and on the bottom, about three-quarters teeth would be going up, and that gives you a nice cup on the top, and it doesn't rip through the bottom to get you a nice cup. So that's the one I use. The exact number of that um, I have written down, not here, but I can give that to you. But it's Pegasus. It's a modified geometry. It's two point. It's two lot. It's reversible. And I think if you type in that, you can probably find it. And is that specific for what kind of uh, saw you're using? Because obviously the depth of the. Um, uh, I use a delta saw, but it would work on any of these. It's a standard, standard little depth. blade. Yeah. Um, it's got 15.4 teeth per inch or something like that. I was going to say, um, I tried that and I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get it lined up. You have to have it so that the teeth are, the teeth on the top are down and the teeth on the bottom are up. So if you have your blade just a little bit off, I might as well have just had it in a regular blade. <laughs> so um, I just ended up using a Pegasus, but I used I use a super skip, so it's pulling less of the paper each time, I guess, or less of the the um, image and such. And that's where I also put transfer paper on it, so it's more tearing the transfer paper than it is tearing the image and the laminate that I have. And then I also had somebody come up to me. Um, earlier and say that another way that he's done a double-sided before is to take a scrap piece of wood, a thin piece of scrap wood, and just put it on the back side. So it's that thin piece of scrap wood that's taking all of the, the brunt of the blade and the whiskering that happens versus versus the puzzle you're making. Though, if you make a lot of them, that's a lot of scrap wood. I just wanted to add that I use a uh, Mm -hmm. I've used uh, it's the NK two O's and the American Scroll Saw. They're regular clay, and they're really bad for like for lights or other things. But if you change the blade frequently, you don't get a burr on the bottom side. So you get some amount of cut and it's smooth. And you can also use matte board as well as wood. It's Anything else? We have a few minutes left. Panel of experts. Five minutes, ten minutes. Here we go. There. Okay. Yes. This is Amy Scott in the house. Yes, I see Amy in the front row. Amy is a New York artist, and her work is in the back, about the middle section, and she paints on wood and does a beautiful job. I don't know if you... I don't use acrylic. They're all um, paint or oil. 
that he shipped to Haiti and had Haitian artists paint and then he would cut up the board and they're gorgeous. But I will say one problem is that if you don't, if you don't handle them extremely gently, the paint can chip off. Okay. I have an interesting comment. Take it away. Tell us how you feel. And just so you probably agree with this one. So, uh, interesting thing that I've stumbled across lately is that uh, instead of painting the blank first and then cutting it, I ended up getting some smoke marks on there that I couldn't get off of the watercolor before sealing it. And I don't seal it before cutting it because the sealer will boil from the laser, so it'll leave like little burnt edges. So recently I've been trying uh, cutting it after it's been primed, so it's got white surface, and I cut it, I cover it with masking on both sides to keep the smoke down, but it still kind of seeps through. So I cut it, I take all the masking off, I wash the board with like the top with like microfiber and soap and water, and like get it, get as much smoke off as I can, any type of residue, and then I'll paint it. So uh, you wanna comment on that? How many pictures do you print the image afterwards? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's convenient to, to see the image afterwards, though I understand that that wouldn't really work for handcuff muzzles, like I said, I mean, for most cuffs, I imagine. But yeah, I mean, printing after you cut has a lot of advantages in terms of just like you have a lot more freedom to do whatever you want with the pieces. I mean, Chris cuts and then paints pieces. And yeah, they're just creative opportunities that you have. Right, that's another that option way. as far as painting is using spray paint. Uh, almost every, like 99% of what I do is spray paint. Um, it takes a little bit of practice to make it look decent. But uh, yeah, I mostly use Rust-Oleum and uh, um, generally do lots of very light coats and give everything lots of time to dry, keep things as clean as possible. And again, it's, it's pretty light fast, but you don't want to leave your, your uh, puzzles in the sun, direct sunlight for any period of time. The same goes with printing, I think, with paint. Um, so, and there's a ton of other spray paint brands out there, some, lots of fancy graffiti brands, you can get like literally 300 different shades of colors. Rustoleum only has about 60 normal colors, but you can use things like spattering and modeling and all these other techniques that you can do with spray paint that you traditionally can't really do with brushes or other um, painting techniques. But there's really, the sky's the limit as far as non-traditional you know, ways to finish your puzzle besides just printing. Anything else? We can see that we all have our challenges on woods and papers and sealers and glues and all these different things. So um, I hope you learned a little today of what we go through and what you will probably go through 
if you take up this uh, sport, so to speak. Um, and with that, is there any other questions before we close? And then we'll make I want to thank the panel. We have Ron Moore, Turtle Teasers. We have a lot of free space. Janelle, we know for sure. Three Cat Max. We have Shay Carmichael, Shay's Workshop, Puzzle Workshop, Conrad, Conrad Armstrong of Conrad Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesse Lou and the last here, I always forget Rosa of Nova's system. So we thank you very much and maybe